Hello, this is Jim Schaefer, executive producer and host of Rip Rap, the academic book television program. My guest today is Randy Beyer, and today we're going to talk about um, books that we've received, including the notion of shared responsibility in education and the so-called truth machine or lie detector. Welcome to Rip Rap. I'm glad to be here again, Jim. I will tell only the truth today. <laughs> um, this book, I wanted to lead to a discussion uh, that I, a concern that I have with, um, with education. It's a slightly older book. It's Building Shared Responsibility for Student Learning by Ann Cosmos and Jan O'Neill. And I really like this book mm -hmm. because it talks about how everyone is involved with the school community is, has a shared responsibility. Um, and that once pe everyone accepts that, then you can make a difference in how it functions. Mm -hmm. So it's about the ecosystem of education, yes. in a way, the it's human great. ecosystem. Which is of interest to me as I'm working my dissertation. And it says there's three components that are critical to this uh, situation. One is focus. So you need to have a common vision, mission, values, and expectations. I'll have to share that. And the other one is reflection, which is the commitment to test your assumptions, to learn from data, and adjust practices accordingly. That's the tough one. And the third one is collaboration, which is the process of developing relationships where all work toward the same objectives and rely on each other to achieve their goals. Mm -hmm. And there's so much tension right now in the field of education about this. Um, but they seem pretty generic, those, those three yeah. options. I mean, there's nothing radical or, or no, it, it would different appear, about them. They appear would, quite logical, right? Yeah. You adjust this, this age data of so no much. child left behind mm. um, and the draconian measures that are coming from that is really upset the people in, in K-16, really, because yeah. It's, yeah. it's coming to the college level also. It is, indeed. Yeah. But I like this premise of taking responsibility and, and that's everybody that's parents students administrators faculty all need to accept that they need to you know get on the same page and do this and this idea of working together to improve the school communities I think is really crucial um, and that sets the framework for a new book by Vincent Tinto um, who is one of the leading authorities on um, student retention. He's been uh, in this area, in the Ann Arbor area, to give presentations before. He came yeah. to uh, Eastern Michigan, uh, you know, where I work, uh, to talk about retention. He did a series of workshops for us there. Well, th this, he's written a number of books over the years and a ton of articles. Um, and what I find fascinating is that this kind of brings it all together. This just came out this year. It's mm -hmm. Completing College Rethinking Institutional Action, which is another focus that I'm interested in. And uh, he, he makes several points, but one of them that fascinated me is that there's an agreement that, you know, there's been all this quantitative research and it hasn't really made a difference. And there's agreement of the, the need for action um, and that uh, there's also an agreement on the, the impact of working together uh, for student retention. There's several different, it's similar to that other book we just talked right, about. Right, same idea. That we need yeah. to really sort this out. But one of the things he talks about is the disastrous impact if we don't do this. You know, that... Um, um, we, we need to know how, how to succeed, but the consequences for students are profound. Um, and so that, for example, as many as 50%, if not more, all beginning college students are undecided or uncertain about their educational vocational futures. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And then we wonder why they change, you know, or why they don't stay at it. Um, so this whole thing about working with students to have them try to get a firmer idea of what they're doing is crucial. Um, and uh, 
faculty involvement is, is good in the sense, well, one of the things he points out, out of the whole college experience, the only place where st students really have one-on-one -on -one time with faculty and their peers is in the classroom mm. to talk about, you know, to, to look at learning, pro the learning process. Yeah. And so I think that means that what we need to do is to work with the classroom to make it a true learning process. A um, place for engagement. Yeah. Yeah. And because that's what my students talk about. They, they, they really enjoy the opportunity to talk one-on-one -on -one and figure out what, what needs to happen. But the, the need for effective action is just profound. Mm -hmm. um, well, what are some of the points that he, he must have to look at a wide range of different types of institutions because I know that even in this uh, in this area here we have uh, two very large institutions Eastern Michigan and the University of Michigan of course uh, but they have very very different um, demographics entirely the University of Michigan people tend to uh, I know a lot of students leave but in general they they are you know they're there for a four-year stint at Eastern it's a largely commuter, it's a whole different uh, economic bracket of students in general. And so they come to school, leave school, come to school, leave school. They'll traverse through this thing in a, a much longer time period and without a certain kind of, uh, in some cases, uh, consistency behind it. Well, you're really quite, you're quite right. I mean, there is a differentiation of the kind of institution. And I was talking to the vice chancellor for student success at, a, um, at Wayne County Community College, and he was making that point that community colleges have a different right, right. population, different dynamics. You're right, uh, I should have included. Might apply, what might apply for a four-year university wouldn't necessarily apply to a community college where someone may go there just to get a certificate and maybe doesn't even need the total certificates, needs certain classes. Right, or classifications, qualifications. Or or right, I should have mentioned our, our community college too because of course uh, our county, Washington, has a, uh, a very large community college and then two or three private schools in town as well. So um, it, it really does cut across different institutional goals and whatnot. One of the interesting things he talks about is the need for the administrators to agree on what they're doing because they set the tone, they set the pace, they set the, the framework for what happens at an institution. And it's easy to look at students as coming and going, but it's harder to work through how you're going to address the needs of the students. Yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of initiatives that colleges are making, like summer programs, additional orientation, additional advising. Um, at Wayne County Community College, they're wondering if they need developmental programs instead of that of increasing to tutoring. In other words, that the people would take the same level, but they would have more help sure. in meeting yeah. the, the objectives for that class. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, but I thought, and the what was interesting also is that he defines um, a difference between student retention and student persistence. Student retention is from the institutional point. Right, yeah. Okay. Student persistence is from the student's point. Right. I'm going to get that degree. I'm going to go back. Even so if I have to stop for a while, work, get enough money. And go to different institutions, but the institution will count that as a short student yeah. retention. Oh, well, this is a, a problem. The data collection and getting funding from both state and federal sources is is very problematic on this issue because uh, I know some schools, uh, probably including my own, um, uh, come up against this six-year limit um, and whether you can get funding and whether you can qualify certain students for funding, whether they can get financial aid because a lot of students tend to um, take classes when they've, <laughs> when they've got money, you know, not take classes when they don't, and also they try to fit it into work schedules and do both. And but that is a big it's, problem. It's really hard. In my own class. And in your, your case with a community college. Yeah, yeah. There, there's students, are, um, well, first of all, they don't know, if they're first generation students, they don't know what options are available to them. 
that they don't know how to do. You the mean first time in college kind yeah. of students? No, yeah. I mean first generation that within their family they're the first people to enroll in college. That's what I meant. Yeah, yeah. right, exactly. And there's right. a lot of them. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, this this whole thing. For for example, one of the things he points out in the book is well, if you enlarge the scope of the data from to more than four to six years, you get different results. Mm -hmm. Because people will, and I've had a lot of students do that, they may come back 20 years later and well, to finish I, up. I mean, in my case, I was on the 12-year plan. <laughs> Didn't, so it wasn't intentional, you, but I mean, it took me 12 years to get my BA. Another thing he talks about in terms of defining the situation, he talks about um, if students return to the initial institution, it's called discontinuous institutional retention. Mm. If they enroll in another institution, he called it delayed transfer or discontinuous student persistence. Okay, he's got these various categories in order for Well, I think to it's a refinement to try to understand the yeah. dynamics of what the students are doing. There may be all kinds of things that they run into. And, and that's the first generation college student is an important thing because a lot of people are having to go back to college. Um, you know, they may have been a tool and die worker. Yeah. Uh, I've got a truck driver in my class this semester. Um, they have had no experience with the college, you know, with college or what's required. Sure. Nobody in their family has. And so he's, they're, they're going to keep at it, but it, it may be that, you know, they need to take a, a time out. Or well, something. the other aspect of retention that I'm thinking about is the, I don't know if you call this the scholarly aspect or the love of learning aspect, but, you know, College has a purpose in many ways, and maybe that's just reflecting, you know, my liberal arts bias or something, but there's a purpose of, of learning. I mean, if you want to have a, a, a well-educated democratic society that can make decisions, uh, intelligent decisions, you need an educated public. You need an educated population. And uh, it doesn't have to be at a four-year private school. It can, it can be at a... Uh, community college, depend, uh, uh, public university, uh, a wide range of options. But we kind of, in this day and age, because of the economy, I think, we forget that there's a broader mission than just taking a class in order to get a credit out of the way or to take a class to get a certain level of certification. I mean, if you want to be a welder, that's, then you need that. If you need to, if you want to be a librarian, you you know, you need a certain sort of level, professional level of training, but there's a, that broader issue, and I think that has a lot to do with retention because um, uh, we've bifurcated a lot of this college or this uh, education trajectory into well, I think packets also and units. You know, many of the higher educational institutions are marketing a specific degree or certificate or program, which is okay, but one of the basic values of a higher education is to refine and discipline your thinking process. How do you approach what you're supposed to be doing? You can do research on mm -hmm. ordinary, well, it's exactly, everyday things. Exactly right. I mean, it <coughs> takes a lot of critical thinking, whether it's a, 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 a sort of technical field or a, a human-based um, field or even a, you know, a research-based type of field. I mean, it really does take a way to understand the discipline, and that's a tra trajectory that takes time. You know, it has yeah, and a, a pathway. Lot of work. It's right. additional work beyond just taking the class. Right. What are you going right. to do with the class? How is that fitting into you? How you think and function as a person? I have one student this semester who started out going for a nursing program, mm -hmm. and now he's changing to was it. Um, HVAC or the air conditioning, air conditioning yeah. heating and air right, conditioning right. thing. Because after he reflected on it and talked to a counselor, he figured out that was more interesting to him uh, than nursing. Yeah. And see, I think that's where there's a real need for counseling and really close scrutiny is to make sure that people are really fitting up with what they really want right. to do. I think advising is... I I would not be surprised. I haven't seen his book, but I wouldn't be surprised if that occupies a chapter or, or a large sort of subtext in his reflections on this, because advising is really critical now 
And um, uh, there are so many options and, and so many sort of grab bag things you can, you can pick. And we're forcing students to say, oh, you have to have a major, you have to have a major. Well, a lot of that goes without any involvement, any discourse about what they're really truly interested in. Sometimes you don't discover that until you're actually in a situation. Originally, I started working on my dissertation. I was interested in both student retention and graduation rates. Mm -hmm. And what I'm finding is they're two different creatures, you know, because there's even more complexities that come into when you're looking at graduation rates. Someone may have put in most of the time but not quite have accomplished that one other class or something yeah. that he or she needed. Right. Um, and so there's, and then also you have differences in between community colleges and four universities and trade schools. What constitutes completion? Right. You know, is it what the university says is the mandatory course of study? Uh, and that's what this vice chancellor was talking about. Yeah. Is that, you know, if, if someone, all someone needs is a certificate and it's a one year certificate program and it completes that, then he's. Then you've got it. Right. It's he a known item. He's graduated in the sense of getting an associate's degree, right. but he's graduated in terms of filling He's got enough for his field, his particular field. Well, this does get back in some ways, uh, probably in very serious ways, to the ecological idea of the previous book about, about uh, multiple communities being, uh, being tied to you know, particular students and how they, how they go through their education. Well, and, and one of the things he talks about is accountability. Mm -hmm. And again, that's by everybody in the ecosystem. The students have to take accountability for what they're doing, the faculty yeah. and administrators, the institution. You know, I wish we had a different word for accountability. Accountability seems so pejorative or scolding, especially the way it maybe comes out in, in you know, documentation and, and, and course review and accreditation. But accountability is really somebody being interested in you, I think, or at least I would like to see it leaning in that direction. So when you say there's accountability, you participate and complete and finish and engage based on others being interested in your success, not that you have to get this done, otherwise we don't check off this little box. You know, you're not accountable, but the accountability is more, uh, uh, I don't know, it's almost like, you know, parent, parent, child, or friend, friend, or rela a relationship that really goes to get, well, there's get a bonds very, people. There's a very real need for higher education institutions to track this that mm -hmm. has nothing to do with students, has mm -hmm. everything to do with funding, mm -hmm. because it's an easy statistic for policymakers to say, well, you're not graduating. You got all these people starting, <laughs> but they're not graduating. Right. And so they're up against the wall. They are. Because somebody else is saying, you're not graduating. Well, that's happening uh, with many schools here in Michigan, in the state. Yeah, I mean, this is, a, this is like a crisis point for the. So it is a very real thing. It, it, you're right. It's yeah, a very I mean, real you're thing. You're talking about policy, substantive economics. penalties for right. if your graduation rate isn't right. up there. Right. Uh, so it's nice for us to talk about the kind of, you know, what we want in the ideal world, you know, the family concept of education, of educating. But the, the sort of the bean counters want to see rates. They want to see rates of graduation. That's well, where that six year point. Tinto says that the currently accepted measure of normal time to degree completion is 150%. So if you so that's a, where the six years comes from, maybe. If you have a two-year degree, it takes three years. Mm -hmm. If you have a four-year degree, it takes six years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and the same thing applies to PhD programs. Mm -hmm. Normally, it would be five years, but it's often seven, seven or eight. eight. <laughs> yeah. And there's enormous or pressures. <laughs> <laughs> so I, that's I a life. That's a lifetime goal. Yeah. But I found this book really helpful, um, and he says, it's evident the public conversation about graduation rates and institutional accountability has produced a climate in which states will soon require all institutions, two and four-year, to demonstrate their ability to use public resources 
in promoting retention and graduation mm -hmm. of their students. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I first started this project, it felt like I was touching the third rail, as they talk about in the subway, <laughs> because it's of intense interest, and that's why I may sure. have to reduce the focus down to just uh, uh, student retention. But right. it, it was a pleasure to read someone who is really up in the literature, it has contributed to the literature and his reflection on, on what's going on. Um, even though his methodology is one I still object to, which is you know basically quantitative, but still he, he has a superb ability to interpret what's going on. He's at the School of Education at Syracuse, but he's also the author of Leaving College, Rethinking the Causes and Cures of Student Attrition, and co-author mm -hmm. of Where Colleges Are and Who Attend. So I mean, this is this is a major yeah. guy. Yeah. So I found. Yeah, I'm glad really he's come out with that. Yeah. Well, what do we segue to now? The truth machine. <laughs> Speaking of being educated. <laughs> well, we take a look at this. This, one. I understand, is on lie detectors. I haven't seen it yet. Yeah. The social history of the lie detector, the truth machine. And uh, there's a, there's a uh, photograph of uh, uh, someone wrapped with her hands uh, uh, against the palm, which apparently the palms are uh, the very, most, very extremely yeah. sensitive to... Uh, you know they they sweat and they they have nerve endings in them. So, um, but I thought this would be interesting for you to talk. This about is uh, this is uh, written by Jeffrey C. Bunn from Johns Hopkins University Press. Um, but it's it's the illusion that a machine can tell your metaphysical condition. Well, that's a nice that's a great way to start the discussion, I guess, because there's a broader a broader issue with this in terms yeah. of. Uh, anything that comes from technology, we think that it gives us a, a truth that's more objective and final, and uh, one wonders sometimes why. Well, there's a couple things I noticed about that book. One is, the, the, as far as this ambiguity, is that um, O.J. Simpson, after he was found guilty, uh, recorded some excerpts and there were two different sets of people who ran it against lie detector machines. One said it was, he was absolutely lying, and the other one said he was absolutely telling the truth. Amazing. <laughs> well, in his mind, he, he and so, I convinced mean, you know, himself what, what that, is going on here? Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's an example. If you turn the machine on, the machine's going to give you all that truth and um, I know. I've never been on a lie detector machine I've always been curious about it but I would just thinking about it wonder if I would be so nervous by being asked these questions if I you know would be my nervousness would project that I was telling a lie as opposed to um, uh, you know really trying to deceive the thing I've heard stories that the way that you can deceive the lie detector test is to do just that, is that you raise your uh, reactivity. Your level, level of anxiety or something. So that it doesn't reflect right. anything. It's just a you know, kind of a high yeah. uh, plateau of reaction to everything, and then they can't, it's inscrutable. They yeah. can't really read it. Well, the truth machine, a social history of the lie detector. Let's look into this. He's, he's, he, uh, he has chapters of um, some pretty enticing things. The, a Thieves' Quarter, A Devil's Den, The Birth of Criminal Man, uh, The Emergence of Criminology as a Field, um, The Enigma of Female Criminality, Fearful Errors Lurk in Our Nuptial Couches, The Critique of Criminal Anthropology, uh, The Mistake of the Machines, To Classify and Analyze Emotional Persons. The Mistake of the Machines. And the chapter is called Some of the Darndest Lies You've Ever Heard. Who Invented the Lie Detector? Um, and the Quest for Euphoric Security. What a great term. So uh, the first chapter here, the introduction is Plotting the Hyperbola of Deception. So he's really looking at uh, uh, so many broad sort of Really interesting social ideas about what's well, there's the nature. There's a need in the social history, or that's been shown in social history, to identify the liar. 
And, you know, they talk about in there about how this is sort of a Christian thing about the mm -hmm. sinner. Mm -hmm. Who's the sinner? It makes me think of the witchcraft trials, you know. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, if you really don't like someone enough, then somehow they must be lying or not telling the truth because they're not telling the truth according to your dogma. But you can't just blame it on one religion, right? Christianity. No. Are you, are you saying the inf this influence? Is he claiming that this influence from the, the Christian well, the sort the of sin, the th the original sin, sin idea? Yeah, the, the whole sin thing mm -hmm. is you had to what defines the sinner, you know, and, and getting something that would show that person is the, the sinner. Right, right, the actual one. <laughs> and there's some pretty and bizarre had, examples. Had they crime had in, there. in their heart, sin in their heart, even where, if you've sinned in your mind, right? But it, it goes back centuries. I mean, you know, where they try to do things to indicate who was the killer or who was the thief. Uh, you know, uh, they had one case where there was two corpses, kids, and then supposedly when they asked the bodies if this was the murderer, they became robust or something. There's some kind of... Lazarus comes from <laughs> the Lazarus machine. And other, yeah. other examples where someone, someone started bleeding, and so they, they said, well, that must be the, yeah. the murderer. Yeah, right. That but really there is does this inability, which it's, it seems to me there's an inability here that it addressed. So we, we don't know. We don't know how to read nonverbal language. We don't know each other well enough in order to figure out when someone is lying. Mm -hmm. you, mm -hmm. know? you know, uh, just as an, as an offshoot, um, Judith Becker, the, the, the ethnomusicologist, has done kind of empirical work on listening, how people listen, and she, she tries to determine what she calls deep listening, uh, fully concentrated, almost like a body experience of listening, so that you're in, you're in within the listen. Um, and uh, the kind of social and emotional changes and feelings of, of deep listeners. So she's done research on them. She's done the research using polygraph technology because the polygraph can read states, certain physical states, uh, through sweat or sense, uh, re light reactions and whatnot. Uh, in fact, it gives a description here. The classic polygraph exam involves simultaneously measuring a suspect's blood pressure, breathing rate, and electrical skin conductance. As a series of questions, it requires yes or no answers as a series are asked. But the person can also be subjected to more covert scrutiny. Behavior symptoms are observed before and after the test is performed. Cameras behind two-way mirrors may record gestures and nuances of expression. Well, thank you for being on Rip Rap. <laughs> it's my pleasure to be at Rip Rap. Yeah, once okay. again.